It's a good morning to you. Welcome to Asaki Online. My name is Zenzel and David and this is the Breakfast Club. Today in program we bring you yet another interesting episode where we talk uh, to former Zipra comrades or cadres or liberators. We want to understand more about their role in the liberation struggle because like we have always argued that the history of Zipra has not been documented. There are so many stories that we don't know and aside we have taken it upon ourselves to actually go back into history, find out who did what, when and why and we want to understand more the role of the Zipra in the liberation struggle and today in the program we'll be talking to retired Lieutenant Colonel uh, Buenas Labangana whose war name was uh, David Machida um, and uh, we will talk a lot about his title and uh, how eventually he left the army but uh, uh, that's the main uh, interesting story that we'll be talking about. Uh, during the war, he was a, a, a company commander or, uh, yeah, company commander in the Zebra. Uh, so we, we want to find uh, the interesting journey that he took before independence and after independence. My name is Bonas Labangana. I come from Philippus, uh, area called Gozai, under Chief Matuna. Uh, before I went to the Strathley, I was already a teacher, a trained, a well-trained teacher uh, for a primary education. So I did the teacher training for three years. It was called T3. And then I also taught for three years uh, under a school that was under a plum tree. Employees, called employees. That's where I taught for three years. And then at the end of 1976, I decided to go and join the strike. So it's not that we were taken out by any board, but we decided on ourselves, we were two, we were both teachers. So we decided to pretend to be going to Botswana for, for a Christmas, you know. It was just before Christmas. And then we actually boarded a train from Blauai and then we went to Botswana. And when we arrived at Botswana, we surrendered ourselves uh, to the police there. And one of the policemen happened to be my relative. And he tried to encourage me not to go to the liberation struggle, but I refused. He wanted to give me a very good job, but I said no. I left Zimbabwe, I had a good job as well, and therefore, I cannot come here to come and work when I left my job. I wanted my country to be freed, and that's the reason why I actually refused. So they, they then took us to, uh, what you call them, where, uh, refugee camps, yeah, at uh, Francis Town, yeah, that's where they sent us. Initially, even when we arrived, we arrived there, the people that were in charge of the, Francis, of the refugee camp, they thought maybe we were sent by the regime or something because very few people that were teachers or were workers would go there. Mainly it was people that were not working at that time. So uh, they thought maybe we had been sent by the regime, but I, we made it clear that we are just ordinary teachers. Fortunately, some of our people, some of our kids that we taught actually came there. So they actually we did tell them that I know these were teachers, we know them. So that's how we cleared. So that suspicion, that's how it was cleared. And then we had to, from Francis Town, we had to board planes from Botswana to, to Zambia. Yeah. And then from Zambia, when we arrived there, we were taken to Nampundu camp. Yeah, this out. is Angola? No? Okay. It's Zambia. Zambia, okay. Yeah. It was sort of a refugee camp, but there was a lot of exercise drills and all those things that were done at Nampundu. Yeah, that's where we learned a lot of things physically, we had to run around. But uh, initially it was difficult. It was also there were problems of hunger and all those things and thinking of home and so on. But yeah, the exercises were hard. Every morning we would wake up, go and do exercises and then come later on and come and eat and so on. We stayed there for, for some time. 
he washing, we're not even washing during those days. We could stay for some days without washing, doing exercises, hard exercises. But we're not used to that, but eventually we got used to it. it, uh, it actually, it helped us even when we went out for a training. And then from there, we were taken to another camp called the FC. From the FC, we stayed for a short time, and then we were taken to Angola by trucks. Ooh, it was a long journey. It was a long journey through Zambia and through Angola. Even when we got into Angola, you know, it took, took us some days, if not a week or more. Yeah, if not a week or more. And uh, as we were traveling, we could see the destruction that was done by the... What do you call them? The... Unita. Unita, yeah. Unita. It was a Unita. We could see the destruction that was done by Unita and that scared us a bit. But since we had not been trained by the eye, we, the people that were driving and the Cubans that were with us, they, they met us with, no, there's no problem, we should not worry. So we traveled until we went to the camp where we were trained, they called the Mboma. It was called the Mboma camp in Angola. Right there we found the Cubans and a, a few Soviet from Soviet Union. I think the Soviet Union was actually the head, but most of the people that were there were Cubans. So those were our instructors. So, so we were divided, well, we were quite many, we were divided into companies. And uh, we had 12 companies. And uh, each company, we were looking at about uh, 100, 100 people in a company. So 12 companies, you can see how many we were. And then from one up to eight, one up to seven, it was infantry. Then the other ones were special units like the motor, the motor unit, the anti-tank unit, you know, anti-air unit, engineering unit, you know, all those groups. So we were trained by Cubans. It was a hard training. So which uh, company did you specialize? Infantry or... I was in, I was in infantry. Okay. Yes, I was actually... Uh, during even during training, I was the company commander of uh, one of the companies. It was company three. Mm -hmm. So you finished training after how many months? The training was just six months for the whole group. But I had to continue another six months doing a, a command training. We were chosen, just a few, I think it was just about 30 or so, that were chosen to specialize more on commanding. So I was one of those that uh, were left there and we, we took another six months training. And then so when we finished, we were already finishing with the second group. Because the first group finished after six months and they went back to Zambia. And then another group came in and continued and were trained for six months. So we, we but we were training on our own as commanders. So it actually took us one year training. So it was, yeah, good and hard training. After training in Angola, where did you go? Yes, after training in Angola, maybe before we get there, after leaving, I mean, before we left the Angola, I just wanted to make it clear, when we were training in uh, Angola, we were actually using live ammunition. That was a great advantage. It helped us even when we got to, when we got to Zimbabwe, which was Rhodesia then, because they were actually using live ammunition. For instance, the anti tank you know, the noise that thing makes when they were shooting Ama, Ama targets, using Ama and take it was really terrible, but we got used to it, you know. Even on AKs and so on, we're actually using a live ammunition to hit targets, motors and so on and all those things. Even those that were doing engineering, they were exploding Ama explosives, actually doing it practically in the live. So, all that noise, we got used to it, so I, it made us, you know, confident. 
and then when we finished we went back to Zambia went to one of the then went to FC back to FC and then were taken to the coaches I can't remember it was called F2 or what the name of 62. those 62 yeah. yeah yeah that's why we, that's where we were yes and then we stayed for some time there and then we went to the Feira crossing point that's where the zebras were crossing when they were going to to Zimbabwe and uh, I went to a place called the Chundu and Mvuti, that's the Urunga area. That's, that's where we, we, we operated most of the time until independence. That's so you operate that time until 1980? So it when is. you are told that there is, uh, we are now having ceasefire, and so mm -hmm. where do you go? Uh, actually what happened, when we were actually told to, to have a ceasefire, I had crossed to Zambia to get more ammunition. So I was actually closed there, so I actually stayed in, in Zambia. And, uh, and then we brought back and we went to an assembly point called the Papa. The Papa, you know where it is, yeah, that's where we went. And that's where, uh, then from the, of course when we were told, that we should cease fire. We didn't think it was a good idea. So yeah, let's talk about you are, you are told to cease fire. What was your situation there in terms of how much ground did you control a zebra? A uh, zebra we controlled a lot of ground, especially that area you Rungwe, Onkeliana, up to Ikaroi town and so on. That place we were already controlling it. We we're no longer moving in uh, in small groups like what the gorillas used. Because in our training it was actually regular. Um, we were not trained on guerrilla tactics, but it was actually regular. So we moved in large numbers. And even during the day, we no longer feared anything. Because we had even anti-tanks and anti-air weapons. So our training was quite different. That's why sometimes we had arguments with the guerrillas, because they just wanted to hit and run, and we didn't. Our, our tactics were different. So you don't consider yourselves as guerrillas? I'm half gorilla and half regular. Tell us about that. Yeah, the reason why we, I would say I'm a half gorilla and half uh, regular arm because initially when we came there and we didn't know the area and all those things, uh, we actually were integrated into the groups of the guerrillas and they were showing us how they were doing it and so on. But later on, we also started showing them our own tactics, not to run away, to attack the enemy even during the day. We we're no longer running away and they were moving in large groups with heavily armed and they, we never feared the enemy like what they used to do. Actually, the whole area, Urungu and Okaroi, all those places were taken, there was those areas and the regime was afraid even to come there. Even when we attacked, we were no longer running. We would attack and run over, uh, and run over camps, soldiers' camps, and so on. I remember at one time we ran over a camp here. That is Zorewa group. What do they call it? Matsagutsa. Matsagutsa. Where is What? Yeah, we ran over the camp, and then nobody followed. They didn't even want to follow because of. The arms that we were carrying, the arms that we had, we were, were heavily armed and they well armed. And they, we could even see from our own locals are thinking that Zimbabwe were going to get it very soon. Yeah, we are really confident we would, would run in Zimbabwe, you know, would overrun in the regime and we're not afraid. So that gave us a lot of confidence. Actually, it training it of using live ammunition helped us. You know, with those small arms, was trying to hit us with small arms, it really didn't mean much to us. We used to armor anti tank motors and so on, and we used that even when we were attacking up the camps of the, of the regime. We are using those weapons, and they are with the great success. So you, 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 then, you, you are then told to go to assemble points. You, you go there. How is the morale amongst the... The morale was very low. 
because to us, we are really sure that we are winning the war. We had no doubt that we were going to win the war. We really, this coming to assemble was really a bad thing to us. We didn't like it. So when, but when sometimes you had to follow a command only, but we didn't like it. And we, we really even did say to our commanders, with love, you are now sailing us. No, we are going to be killed. So when you are moving to the uh, assembly point, yeah. we know the, the the other side left a few people in the in the, in the front, mm. keeping their areas. Mm. Lina, you 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 just withdraw everyone goes. Every Why? Time. Every time. That, that's what we commanded to do, and we didn't like it. We we're complaining to them. We didn't like that. We just told, but because his zebra was uh, very, we were very obedient to our commanders. It was a well-trained army, so sometimes we just obeyed even if you felt it was not the right decision. But you just had to obey. That's, that, that's the main reason why we did that. But we didn't feel it was correct because the the other side, the Zandlers and so on, they started occupying our places where we were, and starting and then they started politicizing, politicizing those people, telling them lies as if they ever fought anything. But in real fact, the people on the ground knew that it was the brother first. Yeah. So now the results come. Uh, mm. uh, Tell us about that day. Uh, right. I could not eat for some days. It was bad. It was really bad because we never thought we would lose because of what we had done and how far we had gone, we had gone with our fighting and the regions that were taken over. We didn't think it was fair, but again, the commanders, especially on Como, they came and started addressing us. Massive points. They telling us that we should not, we should not do anything. But we felt we should go on and fight because, if in our case, the Cubans were prepared to help us, the Soviets were prepared to help us. We had all the weapons at our disposal, and we didn't see why they should be this agreement, you know, and talking and so on, and that's why we lost it the way we lost. We knew by talking, the Americans and the British would give it to the other group, and that's exactly what they did. But if we had fought, the Zebra would have won. And it was really a bad time. We didn't like it. So now it's the time for integration. Where do you go? Yeah, then integration came. Uh, the first battalion, you know, they, we, we went, to the, the, the actual integration was, was done at uh, Llewellyn Barracks. That's where the training of the battalions was done. So the first group was taken by one of us, the Pro commanders, uh, Omar Tube. He's the one who became the, the first commander. And then the second group, I became the commander of the of the battalion. Uh, but this one, which was battalion was this? Mine was it was it was called four one, meaning okay. if under four brigade. Okay. Yeah, it was four one. That's the battalion that initially uh, then went to Konmar. Okay. So, but what we realized even in our training there, it was mainly the Zanlas and the Zebra. And the uh, regime was only there on admin and so on. And they were very hostile to us, even in the admin and all those things. They were very hostile and disrespected us. Yeah. And from Ilwelin, then we went to Konmar. That's where our battalion was stationed. So I was the battalion commander there. So you were the one in charge of Konmar? I was the one in charge of Konmar, yes. Okay. Yeah. So I was the battalion commander, they were the one in charge. So I was reporting to, if our battalion was under four brigade, so I was reporting to four brigade commander. The four brigade commander was a white man, very hostile to us as well. Yeah, as I've said, mainly admin parts were done by a regime. So what they were doing, they wanted to make sure that our forces are not happy. They wanted us to fight eventually, you know, something like that. So what they were doing, especially in terms of payment and so on, they would purposely omit names of other people so that 
they don't get paid. So the soldiers didn't like that. And they knew that. We would write properly all the names, you know, their force numbers, every, everything. Send it to army headquarters. And then they would purposely omit the names. And then they say, ah, your people didn't bring the proper names. And that's brought it disgruntlement to the soldiers. They were not happy. And the two, a political scene, you know, if you listen to the radio and the TV, it was as if only Zanda fought the war. There was nothing talked about Zipra. It's as if Zipra never did anything. And that annoyed the soldiers as well, the Zipra soldiers. Everything was being talked about in Zanda. And if you don't call the, the politicians, if from the Zanu side, they were talking ill of Zipra and the Zab. And that angered the soldiers a lot. I remember at one time, Nkala came here and talked at White City, talked a lot of rubbish, a lot of bad things about Izapu and the Izip. That really boiled and angered the soldiers. Even the songs, everything that was happening in TV, and uh, it was all about sun, and nothing, completely nothing about Izip. So there, there was a fight when there was in Tumbani, then there was a fight at Konmara. Uh -huh. You were the battalion commander. I was the battalion commander. So Kumbara. what happened? So what exactly happened there? As I have mentioned, these things were still boiling up. Soldiers were getting angry and angrier as time went on. And especially when they talked even Kumaralis and talked a bit about Isap and Zipra. You know, our arms were not allowed to hold any arms. So our arms were actually put into a, they were actually locked in a house. So even the commanders we were not allowed to have our arms. That's how they did not respect us. Commanders were not even allowed to hold a pistol or anything. They were all taken into the armory. All the weapons were locked there. And as, as I've said, if the other soldiers from the other side, they started singing those songs, the Zanla and so on, and our guys got really angry. And then they broke the armor. So, but what, I mean, this is what I understand. These guys are singing songs about uh, Zanla. Yeah. Why didn't you start maybe singing songs about Zebra? We could sing ours, but ours, you know, we did sing our own songs as well, of course. But what was disappointing is that when it came to radio and TV, it was only Zanda, as if Zipra were not existing. We could sing on our own. But that, even when we went to home, maybe you were visiting your parents, they would only talk, about, ah, why is it we're only seeing Zanda? And there's nothing from you guys. That means you didn't fight. Is that true? So you have to start explaining and so on. But that annoyed our forces. And so that's why they broke that armor. So what were, what were the numbers here in terms of Zipra and Zandla at Konmar, the battalion that you were commanding? Ah, it was, it was half half. Everything was half half. For instance, I was the battalion commander from Zipra. The second in command was the Zandla guy. So it happened even companies. It was the same thing. If the guy, on Z, on, the guy from Zandla was the company commander, he's twice he would be a Zipra. So that's how it went throughout. So if it's a battalion, how many people are there? Mm, about a thousand or so. So yes, a battalion is about ten companies? Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. It was about ten companies. It was quite a, it was quite a large, uh, with a, a lot of soldiers. And the commanding almost a thousand soldiers. It was not a joke. And they knew that and then when they started uh, not giving them any pay and other things, even in clothes and so on, not supplying properly. Yeah, that caused a lot of disbandment among the soldiers. So tell us about the day of the fight. You, you guys, they just woke up and decided, no, we're going to break the armor and fight. As I said, they were talking about it. These people are, treat, are not treating us well. We have to show them that we are also people, we are soldiers. So what happened, they, they broke. They broke into the armor. That was in the evening. It was dark. So that we, they would not be detected. So when they broke out of the armory, they took the arms, 
they gave each other the zebras, they gave themselves those weapons. And then they started attacking the other group. So because our, our Kon, Norway Konmara is, is just close to the road, so after that they also went to the road and made a roadblock. It was difficult to command them, to tell them to stop and so on. It was really difficult because they were really angry. And they understood, and understood why they were so angry. So and where are you when this is happening? I was also, I was also there. But then I had to go to Gueru to go and report the case to the commanders there. At Inoi Gueru, where, where there is this uh, e e e training. That's where some of the senior commanders were. So I had to report them, to tell them exactly what happened and also report to a four brigade what happened. And then I, I also went back there. And then that's the time when also, Onkomo, they flew up and started talking to the soldiers, Lagoma Sub and so on. So that's how the whole thing subsided. But the soldiers were still not happy. They wanted the fight to continue so that they could be respected as well. Because they felt they were not being respected. It was, it was as if they had not fought any war at all. So they wanted to fight and win it by, by use of arms. And so they copied what happened at Kutumban and also did it at Konmara. That was the main reason. They wanted to free themselves. They wanted to take over the country. So the people died? Yes, people died. They did die. Especially so you, you lost soldiers from both sides? From both sides. Although mainly it was the zebra that hit arms, most of them. It was mainly from... The people that lost their lives, it was mainly from the other side. Because they didn't have guns? Yeah. So now the, 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 the fight has happened, people have died. What happens? Your bosses call you and ask you what is happening? Yeah, they did. But I explained. Actually, they'd come, I think it was a, a week or so before, and I told them all these problems. With the, these speeches that are being made on TV and the radio that is stepping our soldiers. And also the admin part and how the soldiers were not happy with the payment and all those things. So I had explained to the commanders when they came, uh, Masubu and the Nongo, I had explained to everything. Uh, so when this happened, I also told them, I told you, I told you about these things and uh, nothing was done about it. So, and then that, that's the result. So I was called and I, I, I explained everything. And then after that, they actually, they took me to Fort Brigade to go and stay there. Yeah, stayed for a short time and then they sent me to KG6 headquarters. Yeah, and that's where I worked, but I knew it So you were, you were removed as the battalion commander? removed completely from the forces. Okay. Because they thought I had influenced the soldiers to do what they did. And then I told them where the problems were coming from. So they thought I had influenced them. So they then took me to KG6 to go and work there. But I knew it was a setup. So I worked there and I admin were doing mainly I'm a transfers of soldiers and so on. So while I was still working there, suddenly CIOs came the Central Intelligence Organization people. They came and then they said they wanted to go and interview me. Okay, I tried to say, okay, let's, let's go and where exactly are you going to interview me and so on. They said, I don't worry about that. Don't take anything because we're going to bring you now. But I was not, never brought back again. That's how they took me. So and they, so they take you where do you go? They sent me to a different police camps, uh, you know. Emma, Emma, you know, Emma, a police camp, and they have got these houses where they they keep uh, criminals and so on. Say so they would take me to one place and then move me to another place and come and interview me, then move me to another place. So basically, you had been arrested. I'd been arrested. Yes, okay. they arrested me and. Uh, 
even the food that they were giving us. I remember whether it was Mbari, where I had to get food through a window, a small window, you know, eating from outside. Or if it, there was a bone, you could not take it out. <laughs> so, yeah, it was, it was actually, they were actually torturing me for a long time. For almost a month or so, I think, before they sent me to Chuchukrupi. So what were the questions you were being asked and what were you charged of? I uh, mainly it was, yeah, you, uh, once you have been making meetings and uh, planning to overthrow the government. It was mainly that. And then I would ask you to which meetings, who was there? Can you bring somebody who can say I was with him to these meetings? And there was nothing. They did torture me, beat me, because they wanted me to release information, especially about the arms catches and so on. And then there was a time, it was when they took me, some people had hit the state house. So all those things, they wanted me to admit that I was involved, I knew about it, we planned it, and I was also there. Something that I didn't know I was not there, arms catches, I was not there. So I didn't know, but they wanted me to agree to it, and I continually refused. It, despite them hitting me, you know, they had cuffed us and put leg irons and so on, so as we moved around, it was difficult. It was painful, actually. Yeah, and then they were saying, I, we, we, from here, you're going to be killed, and then nobody will know anything about you. So even if you refuse to tell us the truth, because they were saying I was not telling them the truth when I was actually telling the truth. They said, if you don't tell us the truth, I was just going to kill you and they bury you somewhere. So do you still remember some of the names of the people who were especially? Uh, those guys were changing. Although it sometimes there was a guy who called uh, my name's Akona, they couldn't mention them because they didn't they didn't tell me their names. They didn't even want me to know them. And they could change from time to time. Very few I think there was only one who could speak in the veil, otherwise the others were speaking in Shona and so on, so uh, it was really difficult we had a hard time. Mark. They kept on changing us from one. I think they thought maybe our parents or the other guys from Zipra will find out where we were. So they kept on changing us from one police camp to another and so on. So you, you stay in, you, you don't go to court? Uh, what happened is no, when I was, when they were, I think it was for a month, they were moving me from one police camp to another. We never went to court. Until when they sent us to Chikurupi. When they sent us to Chikurupi, that's when, I, that's when I found out a lot of these guys. That's when I met Banata Vengwa and so on, and the, all the commanders and many other Zipakaters that were locked in there. I, it was, you know, that place, even up to now, you know, you know the walls were so high that you could not see sunrise, and you could not see the sun, the sunset. You know, there was a time when I really longed to see sunset or sunrise, but you couldn't see it because the walls were so, were so high. Mm. We only saw the sun somewhere when it was right up, maybe ten o'clock or so, and then three or four, then you couldn't see the sun anymore, and. But fortunately, we were other guys, so we just talked and s they actually closed up even starting. You know, during the Smith regime, detainees were actually allowed to start and so on. But that was closed to us. So if you wanted to start, you had to do your own, go and pay, get your own money to pay and so on. And uh, since I was in the army, they also stopped our pay. And they say they stopped the pay because from the date of arrest, no more payment. So we never got any payment or anything. And there was a group for almost three years because we were caught in 1982. I think it was June somewhere there, 82. And we were released in 84, somewhere there, maybe September or so, mm -hmm. 84. All these years, we were just sitting there. We never sent to court, but what they did, they would just come. They would, somebody would come, the magistrate would come, and just remand us to another date, and so on. They continued doing that. We really never 
sent to court because there was nothing that they could prove in court. Or there was no reason to send us to court. They knew the cases would fail. But at least Dabengwa and the top commandment, at least they were sent to court, which is better. But still they came, they, they, were, they came out clean. They never did anything wrong, so they were discharged. Whereas in our case, we never even appeared in court. So, so all those family, years, were you married by then? Not yet. I was just about to marry the little child. Then and how does the, the child survive when you're not getting a salary? Ah, they never cared about that. Actually, they used to call us distance, even the, the waters there. They used to call us distance. We were regarded as distance at that time. Uh, actually, almost all the Nevele people were regarded as distance. That whatever you say, it, we just called distance, and they never cared what happened to our families and so on. Actually, it was as if eventually we were going to be we were going to be killed. Yeah, and that's how we felt. We we never even bothered our parents even when we came out because we knew they were threatened. They couldn't come from Utlawai or from Matewe and to come to Arara, otherwise on the way they would get killed as well during that time, during the Kukura old time, that was the time. So it was not safe for the very people to travel to Arara. So you, you are finally released. Tell us about the day. Yeah, and then finally we were released. And again, we didn't think it was true. We thought they would follow us up. And then what they did, and then I was told I have to go to the army headquarters, you know, to surrender whatever I have from the army, uniforms, what have you, all those things. So we, we surrendered to them. And then we were told we were discharged for me date of arrest. So even if we never went to court, I never went to court for the charges that they laid against me. You never went to court? Yeah. The, 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 the army system never tried you? You never no. charged of anything? No, I was not tried. But you were still dismissed? I still was dismissed. And you never challenged that in court? Uh, we did try, but what they only did is to say, okay, instead of it discharge from a date of arrest, we're going to discharge you from a date of a release. And then they gave us a bit of money. And that's what caused us to leave, to get the houses or anything. That was, that's, that's all they did. So uh, when you arrested but, a, a, a Lieutenant Kenneth? Yes, I was a Lieutenant Kenneth when I was arrested. And uh, I was discharged still a, a Lieutenant Kenneth. So by now you would have been uh, one of the Army Generals? Yes, uh, actually people that were under me, some of them, especially from the Zandlers, they are already generals now. Mm. A few from our side who went as far as being a general. But otherwise, most of them. You know, Amazipa, what was happening in National Army? You would have somebody under you as a Zanda, and he would be promoted, you know, leaving you there because you happen to belong to Zipra. Amazipa, they were overlooked, they were not promoted. And that's what caused a lot of disgruntlement in the army. They were not promoted. It was only the Zander that were promoted. Did you get your pension? You know? No. Nothing. No pension, nothing. But it been Because they, 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 they told us that you are undesirable elements. That's what they were writing. You are undesirable elements. Don't want to hear anything about you. So when I mean, I, like enough, when I left, as I told you, I was a teacher. So when I left the army, I just went back to teaching. And you picked up your teaching position? Yeah. So there were never challenges when you were in the army and all this kind Uh-uh. Ah, uh, their records were in poor condition. They didn't even realize I was once in the army and what have you. The records were poor, so they accepted me in teaching again. So then now we, other people are getting the 50,000 of veterans and all that. Do you go to get uh, to get that money? Yes, I, I, I actually went until we, we, we went there to be vetted. They actually had to go through a process to be vetted and so on. Yes, and they vetted us and then they, they gave us that money. So that, that, that's all that we got and uh, I bought my house from that. 
So, like, uh, I mean, these days, if you had seen leading to the July 31 uh, demonstrations, you know, people were beaten up and you know, accused of, uh, you know, trying to overthrow the government. And it, at one point, you are accused of throwing, overthrowing the government. So, when you see those things, you know, do you see any similarities? Yes. I just seem like that's what they always do. They always tell lies. Before, I never knew that somebody would be arrested for nothing until it happened to me. That's when I realized, with the, ah, actually somebody can be killed for nothing. Because I had not done anything, I had never went to a meeting or anything. But actually the commander once mentioned it because of what had happened, Konmara, he, that is no. He said, yeah, I'll, 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 I'll have to pay for it. That's what he had said. So I was not surprised when I was arrested. But what is happening now is exactly what was happening during our time. People disappearing and so on. It's still happening even up to now. So you you, you work at KG6 when Nongo is always there. Yeah. And did you have interactions with him? Uh, not much. Not much. I had mainly interactions with the other commanders, especially from our side that were there. It was easy to talk to them and so on. But the Nongo, uh, it was only once in a while when he was giving orders or he wanted us to do something, that was all. You are a lieutenant in the army. Yeah. You are arrested. Yeah. So the, the commanders come to understand what had happened. Like Unongo, did he talk to you and say, but comrade, no, why he are you? he never talked to me. Because uh, actually they, were, they loved that, to get the Zipras arrested. Because they feared the Zipras, they thought would overrun the government, would take over the government. They feared, they feared us so much that they even feared their own shadows. You know, when we're not going to do anything, they just feared us. So they they were really happy that we were arrested. And they never visited us in in Chukurupi, not even one, except the people from our side. Of course, people from home, it was difficult. But at least a few, one or two people came to visit us at Chukurupi. Because they feared that we were distanced and that they thought we were going to be killed. We've got even newspapers to show that even, you know, we're not good people, we're only, we're supposed to be killed. So at one point you just said, uh, I mean, made the mind that you're going to be killed. Yeah, and you made I peace with that. At least even if we get killed, we knew we'd done nothing wrong and that we'd fought for this country so that the people of Zimbabwe can enjoy freedom. Even if they killed me, because I, I had already signed it did warrant when I went out to go and fight. I was prepared to die for my country. I think we, we have learned a lot from this interview, but what I've always uh, told many people and that are, what I always tweet about is that if you want to understand the current government, if you want to understand ZANU-PF, go back to history and look at uh, how they treated ZAPU. Some of the things uh, that we, we have heard today uh, from Muba is what, what exactly is happening now where someone will be arrested and they'll be sent to jail or to, I mean, kept in prison uh, without uh, uh, any charge. And also, uh, this government is easy to accuse you. They, they, they are very quick to accuse you of being a dissident, trying to overthrow the government, being used by the West, uh, and, and, and all those kind of names. So while it's now 40 years after independence, the tactics and the strategy that ZANU-PF have used have never changed. If they think that you are a threat to them, they will go out of their way to make sure that they deal with you, if not eliminate you. So we, we should not just take these things or these uh, interviews as a lesson in history. But we need to understand how this system operates and how they will operate in future when their power is threatened. My name is Zanzel and David. Till we meet again in other programs tomorrow, have a good day.